donation to a charity Chikoni, committed to making the lives of kids of cancer we better. We move to questions without notice. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. What is the current wait time for an NDIS package? How many people with a disability and their families are going without vital services because of the government's delayed rollout? The minister representing the minister for the National Disability Scheme, Senator Rustin. Okay, um, thank you very much, and um, thank you very much to Senator Brown for her question on this absolutely important uh, and massive reform uh, in the disability sector in Australia. Um, and obviously, the senator would be well aware this is a once-in-a-lifetime. It is a massive reform. And us moving away from the block funding model that operated in the past to this demand-driven model has been something that's changed the lives of hundreds yeah. of thousands yeah. of Australians yeah. who live with disability and their families who care for them. Um, Senator Brown, I'm delighted to, to be able to advise the Senate that, the Senate that more than 300,000 Australians now have been receiving benefits through the NDIS. And of that 300,000, probably the most important statistic is the fact that 100,000 of those people actually weren't receiving anything at all before the rollout order. of the NDIS. Senator Brown, on a point of order. Um, point of order on relevance and um, my question, without you know having to restate it, but I will. Uh, what is the current wait time for the for a NDIS package? And that was part of the question. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer and note that she has a minute four remaining to answer. Senator Rustin. Okay. Look, thank you very much. And look, Senator Brown, thank you very much for your question and for your point of order. And um, I'm quite happy to take on notice the de specific detail of your question. But the great opportunity that you give us here now is to actually tell you about the success of the rollout of the NDIS, with an expected 500,000 Australians who who live with disability, uh, severe and permanent disability over, uh, over their lives, are now being able to get order. access to an absolute state-of-the-art, unique— Senator Cormann, point of order. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, interjections are disorderly, uh, and I would ask you to call the Leader of the Opposition and her colleagues to order. I, I was in the process and attempting to. I was having trouble hearing the minister. Interjections are always disorderly. Senator Rustin. Look, um, thank you, thank you very much. And um, look, this is a, a policy that is being put into place that has changed the lives of people who live with disability and their families. On a point of order, Senator Wong. Uh, order. Oh. Can I hear Senator Wong's point of order? <laughs> it remains on direct relevance, uh, which is uh, we understand it's a, a life-changing. Um, reform, which is why Labor proposed it. Um, but the question goes to the wait time. If the minister can't answer it, and I understand she just interjected herself, taking on notice, then maybe she should just end, end her answer. Um, the first part of the question was specifically about that. The minister took that on notice. The second part of the question did go to how many people, and it made claims about people going without, um, and it referred to the rollout of the scheme. I think the minister is allowed to talk about this material and be directly relevant to that part of the question. Yeah. Look, um, thank you very much. And, and, and in providing more information to the chamber about the rollout of this scheme, um, it is pleasing to note that in 2018-19, 115,000 participants. Uh, participants actually joined the scheme in that year. That is more than any other year on record. Order, Senator Rustin. Um, Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. How many individuals did not receive an NDIS package despite having it been budget for, budgeted for in the, in the 2018-19 budget? Can the minister confirm that, as a result of the government's botched rollout, NDIS recipients are receiving just 50 per cent of the approved value of their first NDIS plan? Senator Rustin. 
Look, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and I reject the premise um, of the question that has just been asked by Senator Brown in terms of the rollout. The rollout has accelerated significantly. In my last answer to my last question, I actually pointed out to the chamber that in the last financial year, 115,000 people have actually gone on to this package. Now, look, we are we we would say that it was slightly slower than we would have hoped for start up to the rollout. However, however, 100. Senator people. Brown, on a point of order. Yes, again on direct relevance. Um, the question was um, how many individuals did not receive an NDIS package despite it having been budgeted for in the 2018-19 year? Senator, Senator Birmingham, on the point of order. On, on the point of order, Mr. President. Mr. President, yesterday in question time, you made it very clear that you wished for senators to desist from using points of order to simply repeat the question. Senator Brown, Senator Brown asked a wide-ranging question that related to the rollout of the NDIS scheme. It is very clear that Senator Rustin is being directly relevant to the question. Just because Senator Rustin has not, in the first 31 seconds of her response, come to one point of Senator Brown's question should not be used as a point for Senator Brown to abuse question time by repeating her question order. yet again. Are we taking on the point of order? I'm happy to rule on it, but I'm happy to take more submissions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I'd simply respond to the uh, proposition that's been put by the deputy leader. Um, uh, uh, if there is an abuse of question time, it is, it is in minister's failure to respond to the question, on the and that that is why you are seeing the opposition respond in the way we are. On, on, now, on the point of order, firstly, I did correctly say senators yesterday should not simply stand up and say relevance and read out the question again, particularly when it is part of the question. I would at least ask, ask senators to be a little bit more imaginative in their use of language to make the point of order on direct relevance that does not involve simply rereading out part of the question. The second question you asked in your question, Senator Brown, in my view, when it, in, it includes phrases that refer or reflect upon the government's administration of the scheme, the minister is being directly relevant to challenge those and outline alternative facts. And I believe in this case that is what the minister is doing and is being directly relevant to the second part of your question. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said to the, to the response to my first question, uh, the specific details that are being asked by the senator, I of course will refer to the minister responsible in the other place and come back to her with a response. But the substance of your question is about the rollout of the NDIS. And I can absolutely assure this place that the Morrison government, our government, is absolutely committed to the full rollout of this demand driven, state of the art, massive reform in the disability sector. Senator Brown, a final <coughs> supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Rochelle Orcott has numerous serious health conditions which leave her wheelchair bound and she relies on an electric wheelchair to give her the independence to attend TAFE. Ms Alcock was left waiting 21 months from the time she requested a customised wheelchair more suitable for her needs only for, it, only for it to be denied. The government has underspent on the NDIS while people like Rochelle are missing out. How is this acceptable? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Brown, for your follow-up question. Obviously, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on an individual case. Um, however, um, obviously, that per anybody is, abs is absolutely um, able to contact NDIS. I will also refer the matter, the specific matter, to my colleague in the other chamber. But as I said, with this, the fact that this is such a massive reform in the disability sector, the fact that we've moved from a situation where in the past, 100,000 of the 300,000 people. Uh, now, can I take the interjection, Mr. President, from Senator Brown? I'd just like to point out the very fundamental difference between this particular scheme and the one that operated before, and that it is a demand-driven system. So, therefore, the, order. The, therefore, order on my left. I can't hear Senator Rustin. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Rustin. As I said at the start of my response to Senator Brown's second supplementary question, I am not going to comment on an individual case. Um, I would welcome the opportunity Order, for them to Senator refer— Order. Senator Rustin. Time for the answers expired. Senator <coughs> Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister please update the Senate on plans to commemorate the 20th anniversary 
of the Interfet mission. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Scar for that very important question. As many in this chamber may be aware, Friday, the 20th of September, this Friday, marks 20 years since the deployment of the International Force East Timor, commonly known as Interfet. On this day, the Australian-led Interfet coalition arrived in Timor Leste under the command of Major General Peter Cosgrove. Its mission was to restore peace and security following the violence that erupted in the wake of the 30 August popular consultation on the question of Timor Leste's independence. Through Interfet, Australia and international partners from over 22 nations worked alongside the people of Timor Leste to overcome violence with peace. Twenty years later, this Friday, Timor Leste is a proud nation with a vibrant democracy, strong institutions, and a resilient population striving for growth and prosperity. This is why I am so honoured to be travelling to Dili, along with the now retired General, the Honourable Sir Peter Cosgrove, and the Minister for Defence Personnel, the Honourable Darren Chester, to represent Australia and mark this important milestone in Timor Leste's history. The commemorations will also be significant for thousands of Australians who served in Timor Leste. I'll be joined by a contingent of around 60 serving Army, Navy and Air Force veterans who served with Interfet Mission, as well as the crew of HMAS Chules, which will be in Dili over the commemoration period. I very much look forward to standing with the Timor Leste government and the people of Timor Leste to remember Interfet and all of those who served so honourably in the pursuit of peace. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Mr. President, can the minister update the Senate on Australia's defence relationship with Timor Leste? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Scar. Since the days of Interfet, Australia has worked tirelessly with Timor Leste to develop its defence and its own sovereign security capability. Today, Australia is Timor Leste's largest development and security partner. Senator Our $7 million defence cooperation program has almost doubled over the last five years and is now the second largest in the region, behind our contributions to PNG. Our $7 million defence cooperation program focuses on two-way cooperation in the areas of maritime security, engineering and infrastructure development, logistics and also peacekeeping. I very much look forward to learning about Timor Leste's priorities for future security cooperation when I meet my counterpart, Minister Meno, tomorrow. My visit also coincides with the conclusion of Exercise Hari Hamatuk, a month-long annual bilateral engineering exercise. This Order. word Senator means Reynolds. building together Time in testing. For the answer has expired. Indeed we are. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, can the minister update the Senate on Australia's maritime cooperation with Timor Leste? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President, and again, thank you, Senator Scar. Australia is working with Timor Leste to address shared maritime security challenges. In August, our Prime Minister announced a new joint maritime security package. This package includes a commitment to fund the construction of a new wharf and other infrastructure improvements at the Hera Naval Base in preparation for the arrival of two Australian gifted Guardian class patrol boats in 2023. In the interim, Australia will provide Timor Leste with a vessel to assist the Timorese naval component to develop core skills and experience at sea. During my visit to the Hera Naval Base, I will formally offer to further support to fund a concept design for a broader upgrade of the base to ensure this important naval facility meets Timor-Leste's sovereign needs. The support will significantly enhance Timor-Leste's capacity to patrol and also to protect its maritime domain. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the minister for the NDIS, Senator Rustin. I refer to reports on the ABC which show that the Morrison government has propped up its 2018-19 budget bottom line by pocketing $3.4 billion from the National Disability Insurance Scheme. What is the total underspend on the NDIS in the fiscal years 2017-18, 2018-19 and 2019-20? The Minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, Sir Senator 
for her uh, for her question. Um, the, the figures that you're referring to are published in the uh, in the budget papers. But what I would draw Order. to your attention, you're, oh, what, you you're, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to bring the budget papers in there and table them if those opposite Order. would like to have a look at them. However, but what I would say, and I would draw attention to the chamber, is the fact that this is a demand driven system a demand driven Order. system so that means that means um, that if, if people people Order. who wish to uh, access the system do so at their demand um, the progress of the NDIS has been entirely consistent Senator with, its, with its trial Senator and the transition phase um, and obviously this has been a large part to, to do with Senator moving Rustin, please I'm going to when I can hear your answer, I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to continue. Order, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, as I was saying, you know, this is a largely consistent with the, the move from block funding into a demand-driven system. Um, and so, but, but also, one of the most important things to realise is that as part of this process, 100,000 people in Australia who currently live with disability are now being able to access a package specifically designed to their specific needs. Um, and and so 100,000 people who otherwise wouldn't. So, uh, but in, ca in the case uh, of the question asked by um, Senator Gallagher, I am more than happy to provide the budget documents so that she can see the exact numbers herself. Order. Senator, Senator, Ga Order. Order. Senator Gallagher is on her feet. Supplementary question. However, supplementary, Mr. President, can the minister confirm that over the last two financial years alone, Australians, Australians with a disability are now six billion dollars worse off as a result of the government's botched rollout of the NDIS? Senator Rustin. Mm. Well, thank you. My, thank you sorry, very Senator much. Rustin. Please resume. Your seat. I don't think Senator Rustin had got out of her seat before the interjections commenced. We've had numerous requests from senators. They might be able to hear the answer. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I completely reject the premise of the, 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 the question that was asked by Senator Gallagher, um, and I would refer her back to all of my comments in the previous this question and my previous question in relation to the fact that a demand-driven system is exactly that, driven by demand. Senator, order. Senator Gallagher, a final Waiting supplementary list. question. Thank you. Mr President, how much of the budget improvement that will be revealed in the government's final budget outcome is built on the back of vulnerable Australians with a disability who are not getting the care and support they need? Order. Order. Senator, Senator, what, Senator Wong. Senator, Senator Wong, you commenced that. You co order. Order. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. And I would draw the attention of the chamber to my previous answers to exactly the same question. Um, however, we should make no apology about the fact that we manage our budgets appropriately and target them to delivering Order. outcomes for more vulnerable Australians. That is the job of government, is to make sure that vulnerable Australians get the services they need. And that is exactly what the NDS is designed to do. Senator Steele John. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. All righty then. Uh, my question is uh, to the Minister representing the Minister for Education, uh, Senator Birmingham. I refer uh, to an article in The Australian uh, today in which the uh, Minister for Education, uh, Mr. Tian, uh, cautioned medical students against participating in Friday's global climate strike. Uh, after the head of the University of Melbourne's uh, medical school encouraged students to participate in the strike in recognition of the significant health impacts of climate change. In response, the minister uh, said that uh, medical students should not be striking. They should be striking on the weekend and not about climate change. Does the minister agree with his colleague that school strikes should only take place on the weekend? Order. The minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, um, uh, thanks, Mr. President, and, uh, and I thank the senator very much for uh, for his question, because uh, because indeed, uh, indeed, Mr. President, uh, indeed, Mr. President, uh, those who wish to exercise their right to freedom of speech in Australia, uh, to protest, to strike. 
to make public statements are absolutely entitled to do so. Absolutely entitled to do so. That is something that our government strongly and passionately defends. However, where taxpayers are funding education and services for students to receive, our view is that if you want to go out and protest, if you want to go out and exercise that right to free speech, go your hardest, but do it at a time of day and in a place where taxpayers are not footing the bill for your education. Do it in a time and place where you are doing it in your own time, not when the taxpayer is paying or contributing towards what it is you're doing in terms of receiving an education. That, I think, indeed was put very plainly uh, by Mr Tian. Mr Tian, and I thank you very much, Senator, for indeed quoting him. Mr Tian wasn't saying that people aren't entitled to protest, Order. Uh, they aren't entitled to have their say, but he was very clear in his messaging to indicate that if they're going to do so, do it in your own time, not on the taxpayer's dime. Senator Steele, John, a supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Now I understand that the uh, senator and minister is a conservative, and therefore may not have uh, much personal experience with the types of civil disruption uh, that are often uh, the leading cause of social change. However, given the point of a strike is to cause disruption in order to affect social change, uh, can the government now understand why a strike outside of school hours, outside of business time, would defeat the purpose of a strike? In other words, mate, do you understand Order. what a strike Senator even Steele, is? Senator Steele-John, time for the questions expired. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Steele-John for uh, the, uh, the um, historical uh, um, uh, uh, undertaking, lecture or otherwise, in relation to the purpose of, uh, of strike actions uh, and, uh, and why it is that people uh, may engage in, uh, in civil disobedience. Uh, uh, Mr President, um, our position is, uh, is quite clear. Uh, the actions of students in doing so um, do mean that uh, the potential is that additional costs are incurred in terms of having to reschedule lectures, uh, uh, particularly in the case of medical students, where there are expectations that uh, the courses they're undertaking uh, are, of course, fully received and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, that students need to uh, uh, act there. The disruption is also to fellow students in, uh, in that regard as well. Uh, now, ultimately, Mr President, this is a choice for individual Order. students, but we've made very clear there's nothing wrong with having your say, but do it in your own time. Senator Steele, John, a final supplementary question. Minister Tian went on to say that medical students should instead strike about getting more doctors into rural and regional Australia. Can the minister explain to the Senate the nature of the communications breakdown between Minister Tian and Minister Hunt that has led the Education Minister to feeling that the only way he can influence his own government's policy is to call for a strike against his own cabinet colleague? Senator Birmingham. Uh, well, thank you. Um, Senator Steele-John uh, is often quite literal in, uh, in his uh, contributions in the chamber and interpretation. I'd, uh, I'd invite him to, uh, to consider the, uh, the context of the phrase tongue-in-cheek, uh, that I, uh, I doubt very much that, uh, uh, that Mr Tian uh, is encouraging students to strike, but he is certainly, certainly, highlighting to them, certainly highlighting to them the fact that there are many issues upon which medical, uh, medical students may wish to, uh, to uh, reflect, uh, and one of them that, uh, that he would encourage current medical students to reflect upon is that more of them ought to be thinking about going and working and servicing rural and regional Australia. Uh, and that's why amongst our government's reforms uh, to medical education has been to create rural training hubs uh, that provide more opportunities for more rural students to study medicine in rural Australia in the hope and expectation that they will stay in rural Australia and deliver those critical health care services to rural and regional Australians who need them. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Can the Minister please advise the Senate what the Liberal National Government is doing to support sugarcane farmers across Queensland and deliver stability and certainty to those who are struggling with high energy and fertiliser costs? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Macdonald, uh, for your question and your strong advocacy for sugar growers in Queensland. The sugar industry is a major contributor to the economies of rural and regional communities in Queensland and northern New South Wales. 
uh, generating more than $2 billion for our national economy and making our industry the third largest sugar exporter in the world. In 2017, our government introduced the Sugar Code of Conduct to provide for pre-contract arbitration when growers, millers and marketers failed to agree to terms or contracts or agreements with each other and to guarantee grower choice for the marketing of sugar. The, re re the review of the code last year sought feedback and evidence as to whether the code was operating as intended. And following significant consultation, the government committed to retaining the code, which continues to provide certainty for growers, millers and marketers and the many thousands of Australians employed in the sugar export supply chain. With the code in place, growers, millers and marketers are now able to get on with the job. Our sugar farmers are also suffering low, the, from the low value of sugar costs on the world market, further exacerbated by India's announcement of a six million tonne export subsidy of $216 a tonne next year. The Australian government is deeply concerned with India's excessive sugar subsidies. In order uh, for the sugar industry, the government has exercised our right to protect the 40,000 uh, jobs by actually initiating a dispute settlement action in the WTO against India's sugar subsidy regime. This panel was established on 15 August. India's subsidies are vastly in excess of its limits under the WTO rules, contributing to a glut of the global sugar market and driven prices up to unsustainable lows, hurting Australia's global competitive sugar industry. Our government continues to stand with sugarcane growers and the millers uh, right throughout Queensland and New South Wales. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. The Queensland Labor government is pushing ahead with Greens-inspired legislation that will stop farmers from growing sugarcane on their rural properties. What impact would these laws have on rural communities in North Queensland that rely on a strong and resilient sugar industry? Order. During the question, I'm going to ask for silence across the chamber. Order. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. Queensland cane producers are already struggling with skyrocketing power prices, and now Queensland Labor government wants to impose bizarre new rules on the use of fertiliser and agrochemicals. Queensland Labor's Environmental Protection, Great Barrier Reef Protection Measures and Other Legislation Amendment Bill, commonly known as the Reef Bill, legislates for the government to give itself the power to request documents from all farm suppliers, employees, contractors and customers. In other words, the Queensland Labor government believes that all farmers are liars. The proposed laws will also give Brisbane-based bureaucrats the right to change the rules according to uh, how agri, chemical and fertiliser application at will and with minimal consultation. In some cases, the proposed laws will stop farmers from growing sugarcane on their rural properties. The result, when combined with low world sugar prices and rising costs such as electricity and water will mean many of these farmers will be unsustainable. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Given the Queensland Labor government isn't listening to sugarcane growers, can the minister explain the industry's response to the legislation and how sugarcane farmers on the ground have reacted to this Greens-inspired legislation? Senator Mackenzie. This bill, if passed, will be devastating not only for farming families who have been in the industry for generations, but for local workers on farms, in sugar mills, in sugar transportation and at the ports. It will indeed hurt uh, local economies. And, you know, the Queensland Labor government just hasn't been listening, despite making such a farcical uh, consultation process. They went through Cairns, Townsville, Mackay, Bundaberg—11,000 submissions from farmers, and yet they cannot listen. So let me put on the record some voices of the real cane growers of, on the ground. Burdekin, cane Senator grower, Watt. Phil. I'm pretty sure this is in the majority, Senator Watt, through you, Mr. President. And I quote, we're innovative and we are always striving for best practice, and government just doesn't seem to recognise that. Cane Growers CEO uh, Galligan. Essentially, the government will hand bureaucrats in Brisbane the power to shift the goalposts on cane growers again and again and again. Home Hill Cane Grower Glenn Betteridge. No one is putting more fertiliser on than we Senator absolutely McKenzie, need. Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. On September 14, in 2007, the Aged Care Legislated Review, better known as the Tune Review, was tabled in Parliament. How many of the 38 recommendations has the government fully implemented? 
The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Pratt, for the question. Um, it's, I am looking for the index. Yeah. Um, uh, can I say, Mr. Acting Pres Mr. President, that we haven't <coughs> um, implemented all of the um, recommendations of the tune review? We continue to work our way through that process, uh, and uh, of course. One of the reasons that we continue to do that is because we've called the Royal Commission, which is to look at the uh, aged care sector in a forensic way, which is what the Royal Commission is uh, obviously intended to do. Uh, and we will continue to respond to elements of the tune review while the Royal Commission uh, uh, continues, including things like we've already done, such as the new aged care standards, which uh, began on the 1st of July this year the e commencement of the Aged Care and Quality Safety Commissioner, which started on the 1st of January this year, the implementation of a um, residence charter, which also started on the uh, 1st of July this year, uh, and the commencement of new, uh, uh, new regulations uh, around the use of uh, physical and chemical restraint. So we continue, uh, Mr President, to implement the uh, recommendations of the tune review. We continue to work uh, and uh, monitor the work of the Royal Commission uh, and uh, take note of the comments that are being made out of that process uh, because, as we said, we would not stop the process of reform that we wanted to uh, continue while the Royal Commission was being undertaken, uh, and so we continue to do that. We haven't completed that process yet. Uh, but we continue to walk, work towards that goal. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. On October 4, 2017, the Carnell Patterson review into regulatory processes was handed to government. How many of the 10 recommendations has the government fully implemented? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we haven't completed all of the recommendations of that review either at this point in time, uh, but some of those do include. Uh, some additional legislative processes, which we will bring to the chamber very, very shortly, uh, particularly the handing over of some of the, um, the roles of the department to the Aged Care and Quality Safety Commission, which we started, as I said in my previous answer, on the 1st of January this year, uh, and which are important reforms, which were recommended by uh, the Carnell Patterson Review, and I've had subsequent conversations with. Uh, uh, Kate Carnell about those since that process, uh, in, particularly in the context of the um, order. Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. No, I was just uh, drawn to my attention. Senator Pratt, my apologies. If there was an error on, at our part up here, Senator Colbeck. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. On October 31 this year, the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety will hand down its interim report. How many weeks, months or years will it take the government to fully implement all of the recommendations? What explains the government's inaction on providing quality care for senior Australians? Senator Colbeck. Well, thanks. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Senator Pratt is correct in that the Royal Commission will hand down its interim report on the 31st of July. The government will obviously consider the issues that come out in the interim report, but the report that we will be responding to uh, formally is the final report that is due on the 12th of November next year, Mr. President. Uh, but I reject the premise that we have not continued to reform the aged care system uh, while the Royal Commission has, um, has been in place, because clearly we have and continue to do a number of things. Since the Royal Commission has been called, we've said, as I've said, we've put in the new uh, consumer-focused age quality standards. We have the new single charter of aged care rights. We've established the new independent aged care and quality safety commission. Uh, we've put new provider requirements in place to minimise physical and chemical restraint. Order. There are a number Senator of things Colbeck. that we've done and we Time continue to do so. Expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. What is the government doing to secure stability and certainty for our exporters interested in improved market access to the United Kingdom? 
the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patterson for his question. And Senator Patterson, like every single coalition senator, is, uh, is somebody who strongly backs the ability of Australian farmers, Australian businesses to succeed when they engage in overseas markets, to succeed on the export scene. And that is exactly what we have seen occur uh, over recent years as a result of our government's success in creating new opportunities for Australian businesses. And we want to see the delivery of the certainty of opportunity for Australian businesses through enhanced market access uh, to enable them to be able to sell more goods, sell more services, secure more investment uh, from different international markets. And that has been delivered across each of our trade negotiations. And we stand ready to do so with the United Kingdom uh, when they uh, exit the European Union as part of their domestic policy settings. We stand ready to do that because the UK is a major trading partner for Australia already, our eighth largest trading partner in terms of total goods and services trade, a trading partner where we have existing trade to the value of some $26.9 billion, a trading partner where our foreign investment is valued at some $574.8 billion of support for Australian jobs, Australian growth, Australian companies. And this is critical for us to make sure that we continue to provide support for the growth in that relationship as we do in all of our international export and investment relationships. We have prepared for all of the potential uncertainties surrounding Brexit, including the possibility of a no-deal Brexit, uh, to make sure that Australian businesses can have as much certainty of access into the UK market and to the EU market as possible into the future. We are, as is well known, already in the stage of negotiating a free trade agreement with the European Union, a very valued partner, and we stand ready to commence negotiations formally with the United Kingdom upon them leaving the European Union and to maximise the opportunities of that market as well. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on any recent dialogue with the United Kingdom on trade? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I am very pleased to today have welcomed the UK Secretary of State for International Trade, Liz Truss, uh, to Australia, to Canberra, uh, and with her to have uh, commenced and begun further discussions in relation to the future Australia-UK trading relationship. We have already had a trade working group established with the UK to work through the uncertainties of Brexit, uh, to look at the potential scoping of a future free trade agreement and future negotiations. And today, we very strongly reaffirmed our commitments to one another uh, between our respective countries to launch those FTA negotiations as soon as possible following the UK's exiting of the European Customs Union. Uh, Australia has a great track record of being able to quickly and effectively negotiate trade agreements under a coalition government. It's the success of our government in sealing agreements such as the TPP, as well as those with our major North Asian economies and elsewhere, that is delivering record export volumes, and we want to ensure continued Order. success Senator through Birmingham. such negotiations Senator with the UK. Pa Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the importance of free trade agreements for delivering economic growth and certainty for Australians? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, our success from our free trade agreements has translated into more Australian businesses yeah. exporting. In yeah. fact, 18.5 per cent more businesses exporting today than when we were elected as a government. And it's yeah. grown up to 53,000 Australian businesses. And critically, 46,000 of those businesses are small and medium enterprises yeah. who are having a go on the international stage, enjoying success exporting because of the market access we have negotiated. And in doing so, they're helping to support record numbers of jobs. An estimated 240,000 additional jobs, trade-related jobs, have been created during our time in government. This is providing more opportunities for businesses, more opportunities for employment and, of course, greater revenue for Australia. And where we're seeing that revenue come is across the sphere of our trade agreements. Trade with ASEAN countries up 25 per cent on the previous financial year, with Korea up 21 per cent, Japan up 21 per cent, China up 27 per cent, and plans for expansion into markets like the UK and the EU. Order. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann, representing the Treasurer. Reserve bank interest rate cuts and recent tax cuts have not yet proved successful in stimulating our slowing economy. The key to consumer consumption and business investment is confidence in the future. 
Minister, can you detail what firm plans the government has to restore economic confidence for all Australians? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The firm plans uh, that this government has are the plans that we took to the last election, and Order. which are, of course, uh, reflected uh, in, our, in our budget. And I'm, pleased, I'm pleased to report uh, to uh, Senator Bernardi and to the Senate that more than $16 billion worth of tax refunds have been uh, put into the uh, pockets of hardworking Australians uh, as a result of the income tax relief that was legislated by the Senate was legislated by the Senate uh, in that first sitting week uh, in July. And uh, I would also I would refer to the statements by recent statements by the Governor uh, of the Reserve Bank, where he made the point that he expected, looking forward, growth in Australia to strengthen, uh, to be around trend over the next couple of years. The outlook is being supported by low level of interest rates, recent tax cuts, ongoing spending on infrastructure, signs of stabilisation in some established housing markets, and indeed, of course, uh, by a pickup in the resources sector. What our government is doing, we continue to implement our plan for a stronger economy. Yes, $300 billion worth of income tax relief, uh, providing uh, incentive for, to hardworking Australians and uh, encouraging them to get ahead. Lower taxes for business, uh, an ambitious infrastructure investment program with a pipeline of $100 billion worth of investment, an ambitious free trade agenda. We are working to cover 90 per cent of our uh, exporting uh, exports in products and services by free trade agreements. It was 26 per cent when we came into government to give better access to key markets around the world and, of course, indeed, our ambitious plan to bring down uh, electricity uh, prices uh, for business and households. So, uh, Mr. President, uh, I think uh, uh, you will see and I think, I think that you will see. And the Australian people, the Australian people being presented with two alternative plans for the economy moving forward. They opted for our plan for lower taxes, stronger growth, more jobs, uh, and indeed uh, higher wages over time. Because, of course, if you look at the last 12 months, over the last 12 months, 2.6 per cent growth in employment compared to 1.5 per cent employment growth when the budget was delivered for the 2018-19 financial Order. year. Senator it is very Coleman, clear that our plan is starting to has work. has expired. Senator Bernardi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Minister. Australia ranks poorly in global cost of living surveys with high utility prices, housing, transport and food costs, all negatively impacting on many Australian families. What is the government actually doing to lower the cost of living for Australian families? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. We are very committed to easing cost of living pressures for families and are taking action to ease the strain in areas like tax, energy, housing and childcare costs. And we're getting interjections from the Labor Party. Just remember, if the Labor Party had been elected in May, we would now have higher taxes, we Order. would have a 45 per cent emissions reduction target. Order. Apparently it's something that uh, Senator Wong is still fighting Senator for to Keneally. drive up but the cost of electricity. But of course, we are focused on more affordable childcare with costs for families down 7.9 following our reforms, more affordable medicines with over 2,100 new and amended listings added to the PBS since October 2013. Labor had stopped listing medicines on the PBS because that made such a mess of the budget. We focus on more affordable energy with energy costs down by up to 15 per cent for over half a million families and small businesses under our policies, more affordable housing. We have successfully implemented the majority of measures announced in the Reducing Pressure on Housing Affordability 2017-18 Budget Package. And indeed, of course, we are about to introduce further reforms in this space. Order. And we have legislated Senator Cormann, $300 billion time for the dollars answer worth has of tax expired. Cuts. Senator Bernardi, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, government intervention and bureaucratic red tape have distorted many market-based pricing mechanisms in critical industries like power and construction. Red tape is bogging down small business and mining, reducing investment activity and jobs growth, making prices for consumers higher than they would otherwise be. What is the government doing to reduce these imposts on these vital drivers of our economy? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we uh, have been and we continue to be committed uh, to make it easier to do business in Australia so that more successful businesses across Australia can hire more Australians and pay them uh, even better wages uh, over time. Uh, we uh, are committed to reducing red tape and unnecessary regulation to reduce the cost of doing business, making it easier for business to invest, create jobs and grow the economy. Assistant Minister Morton uh, is leading the work across government uh, to take a new approach to regulatory reform by tackling a range of barriers to investment in key industries and activities with the aim of boosting efficiency, productivity and job creation, in addition to continuing 
the work the government has done in removing unnecessary red tape. This will look at the issue from the perspective of businesses standing on the factory floor to experience regulatory burden firsthand and is inviting the states and territories to participate. This is not uh, about simply cutting regulations, but systemically uh, tackling the costs of regulatory compliance and processing and removing disincentives to invest and innovate, particularly for new entrants. The government has a rock solid Order, Senator track Coleman, record. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Prime Minister Morrison told the Sutherland Shire leader that aged care was one of three major areas the government will focus on, saying, and I quote, With aged care, we have a royal commission, and I am keen to see more in home care services established. How many new service providers have been approved by the Department of Health to deliver home care in the past 24 months? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Well, thank, you. thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Urquhart, for the question. Um, and she's right to quote the Prime Minister in the Here Here fact Here. that uh, aged care is one of the standards, <coughs> one, of the, one of the priorities of the government, and, uh, uh, because it clearly is one of the priorities of the government. And, and I've heard the Prime Minister make that comment in quite a few forums. In fact, he addressed uh, our party room on Tuesday to say exactly the same thing. It is one of the, it, we, it is one of the key priorities, and we went, uh, went to the election with that priority, and that's why yesterday I was so delighted to announce that the number of aged care packages in the market uh, to the end of June last year had grown by 25,000. That's a significant achievement of this government that we had an extra 25,000 Aged care, uh, home care packages in the market, and uh, that's why at the last order, Senator Urquhart, <coughs> on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. President. It's on relevance. The order. Can I hear Senator Urquhart? The point of order, um, question was very simple: was how many service providers have been approved? I haven't heard the minister answer the question as to how many in the last Sen 24 months. Now, Senator Urquhart, you highlighted the end of your question. Um, I do believe the minister was being directly relevant to the preamble to that. He is entitled to do that. You have drawn your, his attention to your part of your question, but I'm listening carefully to the minister, and at this point I find him directly relevant to part of the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as I said, that's why, uh, following the, since the, last, the budget last year, uh, we have injected $2.2 billion into the provision of home care packages. Uh, it's interesting to note that, uh, despite the concern expressed by those opposite, Mr. President, uh, at the last election they did not put one single dollar into additional home care places. Not one single order. dollar. Mr. Senator President. Wong, on a point of order. Consistent with your exhortation yesterday to give ministers more time, we have done so. The question is not about the policy, uh, policies the opposition might or might not have taken to the election. Uh, well, the question is about the number of new service providers approved by the department in the last 24 months. I would ask that you remind the minister of the question and of standing orders for him to be directly relevant. On the point of order, uh, Senator Wong is correct in saying opposition policies are not directly relevant to the question. However, the preamble to the question referred to a statement by the Prime Minister that claimed a government commitment to a particular policy. The minister is entitled to address that part of the question. I believe what he is saying right now is directly relevant to that part of the question, um, albeit observations on opposition policies are not. Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. And so, as I indicated yesterday, there's now 125,000 home care packages in the market, projected to grow to 144,000 uh, by next year, 148,000 by 2021, 153,000 by. 2021 and uh, by 22 23, 157,000 uh, home Wong. care packages. Point of order, direct relevance. I'm pleased he's found his brief on home care packages. We've actually asked him about new service providers. And, and I've said previously, Senator Wong, I believe the minister, in addressing the preamble to the question, with this material is directly relevant to the preamble to the question. Because the question outlined a claimed government commitment, he's outlining material he claims demonstrates that. You've highlighted the second part of the question, um, but the minister can be directly relevant to any part of the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and and I think it is quite reasonable that I reinforce the government's commitment to home care packages, as stated by the Prime Minister, and we continue to fund more. 
$2.2 billion announced by this government since the budget last year for new home care packages. And, Mr. President, uh, not Order. a cent Senator from Colbeck, the other side at the election of 12 weeks expired. ago. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How many service providers operating and delivering home care have not had a quality review? Senator Colbeck. Uh, or, uh, all right. on, the, on, on the point, Senator Cormann's raising a point of order. Sorry, Senator Cormann. Like, no, but, I mean, Senator Wong is the leader of the opposition. She knows that constant interjection is disorderly. I would ask you to call her to order. On the point of order, Senator Wong. Uh, I think he's referring to the fact that I said that you can do it. Or, now, if that if that if that's an interjection order. he rejects so much, Senator then Wong, I'm happy please. to withdraw Sen it. I, I grant I grant the leader of the opposition, with the standing orders grant them some precedence, more flexibility than others. But I would also encourage all leaders to lead by example. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't have a figure as to the numbers of. Uh, providers Order. that don't haven't had a review, uh, Mr. President. But of the 929 providers as 30 June 2019 in the market, I, I'm, I'll have to take that on notice, and I'm happy to come back to the chamber with a number of those that haven't undertaken a review. Senator Urquhart, a final supplementary question. The Royal Commission has heard of serious defects in the provision of home care services. Have any home care providers been sanctioned? By the Department of Health for non-compliance. Senator Colbeck. Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, I don't actually have direct information re with respect to that, but I order. But I, order. But Mr. President, I, I am happy to say and agree with Senator Urquhart that uh, the that order the issues in left. relation to the provision of home care. Uh, and the quality of home care provision services is one that we are quite rightly concerned about. Uh, to ensure that people who are receiving services in their home uh, receive those services in a safe way, in a way that obviously clearly meets their needs, is extremely important. Uh, and it's one that the government is quite cognisant of and, and very aware and alert to the issues that have been raised by the Royal Commission. Uh, and in the context of the development of a set of uh, compliance frameworks that work not just in home care order. but also across Senator the NDIS, Colbeck, I think it's a very important the direction that we're expired. heading. There is too, order on my left. There is too much noise emanating from my left during answers to questions and occasionally the questions themselves. Senator Reddick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Can a minister please inform the Senate how mining safety practices help improve stability and certainty in the mining industry? And can the minister outline what steps are being taken at a Commonwealth level and in other jurisdictions to improve safety in the industry? The Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Rennick for his question. And, uh, uh, I want to say up front that uh, safety is the number one priority of myself as the Minister for Resources, and I believe it's the number one priority of all resource ministers around the country, as well as the trade unions that represent workers and, and uh, the vast majority of business leaders as well. It should be the number one priority to protect people in the industry. The most important thing people can leave a mine site with is their life and their health. Uh, Mr President, I'd like to recognise that tomorrow is the, uh, is the Miners' Memorial Day in Queensland, which does mark the state's worst mine disaster at Mount Mulligan in far north Queensland uh, in 1921, where 75 miners died. And there's a memorial service in Mara tomorrow to, to see that. Mr President, now in my area, responsibility for the offshore oil and gas sector, uh, uh, it is good that we've had six consecutive years now without a fatality. We can never rest on our laurels, though. And in the first half of last year, we had a surge in near misses, which could have caused a death or a major or a serious injury. Uh, so at last year's APIA conference, I convened a, a roundtable with leaders in the oil and gas sector to remind them of their obligations to protect health and safety, and also mentioned the issue in my speech to the conference. It has been a welcome result that in the second half of the year we had a major drop in those incidents, and in fact by the end of 2018 we had recorded the lowest, uh, lowest number of um, 
uh, near misses that could have caused a death or serious injury since 2010. Mr. President, also recognise there has been a surge in uh, very well, there has been some tragic fatalities in the Queensland coal industry over the past year. And I, while this is a matter for the Queensland government, I fully support the efforts of my good mate Minister Lynham there in Queensland, who is working hard to make sure that safety is reset to be a priority for the industry there. Uh, the Australian government fully supports the safety reset that is occurring in the Queensland coal industry and encourages all businesses uh, to make sure they uh, meet their obligations under that policy. Senator Reddick, a supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any incidents at mine sites and mining facilities that puts at risk the safety of hardworking Australians going about their business? Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Look, Mr. President, um, we have seen, unfortunately, a number of examples where activists' groups, uh, sometimes encouraged by people in this place uh, irresponsibly, uh, have put worker safety at risk. Uh, since the federal election, in, in particular, a number of environmental activist groups are throwing a long hissy fit about the results of the election and are out there supergluing themselves to streets in capital cities and in sometimes uh, um, putting themselves in extremely dangerous positions at mine sites or ports uh, that put at risk not only their own safety but also the workers there. Right. In fact, at a, at a rally of the Extinction Rebellion Group in Brisbane earlier this Why year in August, about? attended Order. by Senator Larissa Waters Order. and Greens Councillor Jonathan Canavan, please Street, resume. Senator activists Canavan. were Senator encouraged Canavan, to illegally please resume blockade. Your seat. This was not I'm not drawing attention to Senator Canavan here, but I'd like to be able to hear the answer. The interjections across the chamber at the rear of the chamber are utterly inappropriate. Senator Canavan, please continue. Well, Mr. President, they're obviously shamed by the fact that Green senators in this place are encouraging people to illegally blockade freight lines in Queensland, putting at risk worker safety, not just the safety of those uh, involved in the Order. activists, but also people are just trying to make a buck for their families, and they're putting their lives Senator at risk taking these irresponsible actions. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any organisations seeking to benefit from inappropriate and dangerous actions around mining facilities? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, we have heard in the last couple of weeks through leaked documents from the group Student Strike for Climate ah. that so-called activist groups are also encouraging people, and I quote in, uh, in campaigns they've sent around to people, I quote, that they encourage people to join your union, join today, and encourage your colleagues to do the same. That email, that communication, then to, links to the Australian Council of Trade Unions recruitment website. And the ACTU have been out there encouraging people to take action to, to be out there in this strike on Friday. There's also encouraging people to take this Order. kind of unsafe action. How can a trade union, who is meant to be there to protect worker safety in this country, align themselves Senator with Wish people Wilson. who are directly encouraging people to put worker safety at risk? It is irresponsible, reprehensible, and it should be condemned by all in this place that want to stand up for worker safety and just protect the rights of Australians to go to a job and go home safe. Order. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. It's been reported in the Herald Sun today that the member for Chisholm promised she would write references for foreign students, which could lead to permanent residency, in return for volunteering on her campaign. Minister, is this an appropriate use of Australia's immigration system? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I do thank uh, the senator for the question. And I have to say, it's disappointing you actually took it from your question time team, because I actually thought you of all people had more integrity than that. This Order. is nothing more and nothing less, nothing less than an attack on a member of parliament that has been validly elected by the people for Chisholm. In relation to the article in the Herald Sun, I would say to the Senator this. Under our immigration system, all visa applicants' individual assessments are assessed against all legal requirements. That happens to be a fact. That is what happens. So, Senator Rapp, in, in, in answer to your question, this is just all about more personal attacks on a member of parliament who has been validly elected 
by the people in her electorate. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. On of order, direct relevance. There is a public allegation, so the, the, the senator is not making the allegation. Uh, a public allegation uh, that the member for Chisholm promised references uh, as an, I suppose, inducement or an encouragement for volunteers on her campaign. The question is whether that's an appropriate use of Australia's immigration system. On the point of order, I believe the minister's observations about the operation of the visa system were directly relevant to the question. I believe those are directly relevant to the question. Um, to range outside that policy portfolio area would not be directly relevant to the question. Senator Cash. I finished my oh, The answer is concluded. Senator Ciccone. Has the member for Chisholm made any representations directly, either via phone, email or in writing, to the Minister for Home Affairs or the Minister for Immigration regarding the permanent residency or other visa-related matters of individuals who volunteered on her campaign? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And again, in response to Senator, Senator Ciccone's question, Senator Ciccone, the way our immigration system works is if a particular member or senator makes a representation to the minister, and I can assure you, I can assure you, if you look at your own side, there will be plenty there who have made representations. That representation Order. is assessed in accordance with all legal requirements. This is nothing more and nothing less than an attack on the personal integrity of the member for Chisholm, validly elected, despite whether you like it or not, by the people of Chisholm. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, does the minister support the member for Chisholm's Visa for Volunteers program? <laughs> Senator Cash. Uh, well, you are putting words into someone else's mouth. I support Gladys Liu as the member for Chisholm. And again, in relation to visas and the immigration system, there is a system in place. All visa applicants are assessed, their application is looked at, and it is assessed in accordance with the legal requirements. Senator Cormann. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Gallagher. President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Rustin to the questions asked by Senator Brown and myself. Um, well, what a question time we just had. We had the Leader of the Government in the Senate nursing his ministers through question time, providing them with suggested responses to questions uh, from Labor senators. We asked some very straightforward questions uh, to both Senator Rustin and uh, Senator Colbeck. Uh, in terms of the questions to Senator Rustin, it was to try and elicit information about the waiting list and uh, the demand uh, for services that people in the community are experiencing or the wait for those services uh, through the enrolment or uh, lack of enrolment through the NDIS system. Now, the reason we're asking these questions is because any person who's elected in this parliament, if they had a range of top issues that come through their, uh, their door from constituents right across the country, are uh, complaints about the NDIS. Now, uh, of course, Labor built the NDIS. Uh, we support the NDIS. We believe it is the right framework to provide services to people with a disability. It will empower people with a disability to make decisions about their own care requirements and will give independence to them and their families uh, that hasn't um, always been available before. We support the extra investment in the provision of it. But what we don't support is a government that's botching the rollout that leaves people either under-resourced through their packages or very difficult to get packages approved uh, and endure long waits either for equipment or services. That is the issue we have. And we know from the budget paper that there has been significant underspends in this program. And those significant underspends are propping up the go government's bottom line. There is no doubt about it. You can't have underspends totalling $6 billion over two fiscal years, and we'll wait for the update tomorrow, and pretend that that is not helping you when you're trying to deliver a surplus budget. 
Absolutely it is. It is a big program with big underspends and a lot of unhappiness in the community about it. They, those are the questions we're asking. And what did we get? We got non-answers. And I have to say this is becoming a feature of this government's attitude to question time. And the response from us is we will have to take points of order because our questions aren't being answered. It is the non answer time really is what we're experiencing and I think it looks like every minister either isn't across their brief or has been given specific instructions not to answer any question they may get asked. Questions may, if we're lucky, get taken on notice. Um, I've rarely seen one of those come back through. Uh, but these details that we ask today should be known to ministers and those representing um, other ministers in this place. What is the waiting list? How, how long have people waited for um, care? What is the current wait time for the NDIS package? What, how many of the people with a disability and their families are going without vital services because of the government's delayed rollout? Can the minister confirm that people are receiving just 50 per cent of the approved value of their first NDIS plan? All quite simple questions that uh, deserve an answer, and they deserve an answer because people are coming to our offices and complaining about the difficulty they have in accessing NDIS services or in getting the care that they need. And, uh, uh, we can go through a number of examples where uh, people have reached out to Labor offices um, talking about the difficulty they've had in getting a response from the NDIA. Now, we're not going to blame this all on the NDIA. They have been unfairly um, restricted in the staffing cap that this government has also imposed on them, that they have to have, uh, they can't employ the staff they need to deliver the services that the people are demanding, and that's one way to control demand. I mean, we heard from the minister that it's a demand-driven system. Well, it's hard. It's it's actually. Uh, hard to deliver that when you don't have the people in the jobs to approve the packages and support the people to tra transition to the NDIS. That is a conscious decision of this government. They are the ones that could overturn that and ensure that the NDIA is properly resourced with the skills and capabilities that are required for the long term instead of relying on contractors uh, to come in and, and deal with the crisis. And that would allow more people to get through and those people to have the, the support they need through their own packages and make the decisions and deliver the vision that was always intended for the NDIS. Unfortunately, this government has taken a different approach. It's constraining demand, and by that it is at the same time propping up its budget. And we will see tomorrow just how much their final budget outcome is propped up off the back of people with a disability not receiving Thank care. You. Senator Gallagher. Senator Scar. Madam Deputy President, I'm quite happy to rise in this place and defend the government's performance with respect to the NDIS rollout. I personally, representing the good people of Queensland, I find it an outstanding performance, and I think the facts actually support that argument. And can I just say at the outset what an outstanding job the Minister for the NDIS, the member for Fadden from my home state of Queensland, is doing? And I've heard from a number of members in the lower house congratulating the minister with respect to the proactive nature of his office when concerns are raised when concerns are raised as they inevitably will be as they inevitably will be with a, a massive rollout of this nature when concerns are raised they are attended to and that's the way it should be this notion madam deputy president that in some way the government is artificially trying to prevent services getting through to those who need them in order to protect the budget budget bottom line is quite absurd, quite absurd, and there is absolutely no evidence to support that assertion. I am sure that every single senator, every single senator sitting in this place wants that service provided to the people who need it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And that is exactly what the government is doing. So instead of just bland assertions, let's actually look at some of the facts in relation to the matter. The NDIS has undergone significant growth. From approximately 30,000 participants at the end of trials on 30 June 2016 to almost 300,000 participants as at 30 June 2019, an increase of 270,000. Significantly, significantly 100,000 of those participants, 100,000 Australians in need, are receiving support and services for the very first time. For the very first time, those people are receiving support and services. So, from my perspective, 
as the senator for the great state of Queensland, this rollout is occurring effectively, efficiently, and it's delivering services to those people in need. Since the commencement of the NDIS, the active provider market has also grown from around 3,500 service providers as at 30 June 2016 to more than 21,000 as at 30 June 2019, an increase of 600 per cent. Again, again, Madam Deputy President, look at the facts. Look at the facts, and the facts support the government's case that this system, one of the biggest social reforms in this country's history, with its bipartisan support, is being rolled out effectively and efficiently and delivering services to those in need. We know, we know, the government knows that the number of participants entering the NDIS is lower than originally estimated. It is a demand-driven system. It is a demand-driven system. And uh, Minister Rustin tried to explain that in the uh, face of constant interjection from our friends opposite. It is a demand-driven system. As at 30 June 2019, there were 298,816 participants who had received disability su support from the NDIS, representing 72 per cent of the original bilateral estimates. This progress has been consistent. It is consistent throughout the NDIS trial and transition phase. In large part, this reflects the shift from block-funded services, where data on individuals receiving services was not, as, not robust. Despite the best efforts of the NDIA, as well as Commonwealth and state and territory governments, there are some people who may be eligible for the NDIS who remain difficult to contact and engage with. And it is incumbent upon every senator in this place and our friends in the House of Representatives to do our best to do our best to make sure the people in our community get the services they need as quickly and efficiently as possible. And the government is doing exactly that. Exactly that. As a result, the number of existing Commonwealth and state and territory clients transitioning to the NDIS has been lower than originally estimated. We accept that. We accept that. But the fact of the matter is the scheme is being rolled out effectively and efficiently and delivering services to those in need. And for those examples, for those examples where people are falling between the cracks, each and every person representing their state or their local seat in this place needs to bring those facts and circumstances to the attention of the relevant minister, to the relevant agencies, and do our best to advocate on the part of those people to make sure that they get the benefit and the services that they deserve as Australians. Delivering this great groundbreaking reform, Madam Deputy President, to improve outcomes for Australians with a significant and permanent disability will inevitably involve challenges. The important thing is to address issues quickly and efficiently as they arise to ensure the sustainable management of the I scheme thank into you, the Senator future. Senator Scar, your time has expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. That contribution from Senator Scar was. Um, disappointing and, quite frankly, just plain sad, sad, because I'm sure Senator Scar actually believes exactly what he said in his contribution. And he talked about facts and he talked about um, the, uh, the scheme being, uh, being rolled out efficiently and effectively. But let's look at some of the facts. And Senator Gallagher, in her contribution, where she talked about question time being a non-answer, is she's spot on because that is exactly what's ha happened here today. Because when I uh, asked Senator Rustin um, three questions, she didn't answer any of them. She didn't answer any one. She took the first one on notice, the second one on notice, and the third one. She said we don't comment on individual cases. That's what she said. So she didn't answer. So, and then we've got Senator Scar that wants to talk about the facts about this program he thinks with 77,000 people are actually missing out on the NDIS. 77,000! So that's your efficient and effective um, rollout. That's, that's what that means to those people that are out there waiting, trying to get the services that they need. So we've also, these are the facts. We've had about six ministers in six years. That's a problem. 
Nobody um, stays in this portfolio area for very long. They haven't got a um, they haven't got a handle on what they need to be doing. We have no CEO. Still have what the CEO um, resigned, and we have no C CEO. We've had 1.6 billion dollars taken out of the NDIS. 1.6 billion dollars, and that and that that is money that should stay within the NDIS for services and supports for those people that are participants. That's where that money should stay. It shouldn't have go back and to prop up your, your budget. That is, what, that is what is happening. You put in a staffing cap on the NDIS. Everyone knows, the Productivity Commission knows, that that needs to go because it, there's not enough people to, to actually roll this out efficiently and effectively because you have hamstrung the NDIA by putting in a staffing cap. You put a review in. You don't listen to the recommendations. The recommendation was that the staffing cap needs to be reviewed. Now, we need to come in here, and we do need to highlight the cases where people are missing out. We've had cases where a participant was told um, that who suffered from progressive spastic paraplegia, who said he was not disabled enough. Now, if that doesn't tell you that there's an issue around training and you need to put some more effort into it, then I don't know what's going to. But there's one thing that we can be sure of in terms of what is happening with the government's rollout of the NDIS is that it is not happening effectively or efficiently. Regardless, and I'm sure Senator Scar's contribution was uh, a contribution he believed, but it, the facts do not bear out what your, your contribution at all. So when you're looking at 77,000 people missing out because of the delays, because of the issues around plans, and that and that is it doesn't even go to the fact that 50 per cent of um, first plans are, on average people are only using 50 per cent of, of their first plan. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Because they're not the, the services are not there. That is why. And the and the reason and whose responsibility is that? That's the NDIA and this government. This government is responsible for the rollout. They're responsible to ensure that it is working efficiently and effectively, Thank and you, it is Senator not. Senator Brown, your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The Federal Coalition Government takes the rollout of the NDIS scheme very seriously. And the facts and figures will support this. The NDIS continues to grow at a rapid pace. Progress is being made to enable every Australian with a significant and permanent disability to access the reasonable and necessary support they need to participate fully in their communities. 21,500 service providers have been registered at 30 June 2019. The NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, launched in July 2018, continues to manage provider registrations in New South Wales and South Australia and commenced in all other states on 1 July this year, except Western Australia, which will commence operations in July next year. As at 30 June this year, the NDIS was operating fully in all regions of each state territory, except four regions in Western Australia. And they will join the NDIS in July 2019, and Christmas and Cocos Islands will join NDIS in July next year. Importantly, the NDIS is supporting both people from existing state territories and Commonwealth systems, and people who have never received any Commonwealth support previously. Currently, 99,000 people are receiving supports for the first time. As at the 30th of June this year, 298,816 people with disabilities, including children in the ECEI program, have been supported by the NDIS. 
This represents an 8 per cent increase in the number of participants over the last quarter. An additional 27,853 participants, excluding children in the ECEI program, received approved plans this quarter. The government is committed to continuing to work with the NDIA and state and territory governments to ensure the success of the NDIS. The insurance approach allows pressures on the NDIS to be identified early and allows NDIA management to be put in place to put in place strategies to respond to these pressures. In, this, in the fourth quarter of June 2018, 27,853 participants had their plans approved. A further 5,312 5 children were referred through the NDIS gateway. Of those who were surveyed in 2018-19, 94 per cent in the fourth quarter, sorry, 94 per cent reported that their planner listened to them. To them, 94 per cent considered that they had enough time to tell their story, and 95 per cent thought their meeting planning had gone well. In the fourth quarter of 2018-19, the NDIS achieved 93 per cent of its operational target across. Sorry, uh, across 2018-19, meaning 108,478 of the 116,000 actionable records were processed. Between 2013 and 2019, 298,000 participants had approved plans and 5,312 children were being supported through the NDIS early ECEI gateway. This scheme has been within budget each financial year since it started, including the 2018-19 financial year. More detail on the plan approval performance for the period uh, up to June 19 nationally and for each state territory uh, I can provide. So New South Wales had a total transition of 95,000 people. Up, so that took it up to 104,000. Victoria had a, a transition of 73,000. Queensland, 51,000. WA, 6,000. That's yet to commence uh, ramp up. South Australia had 21,000. Tasmania, almost 6,000. ACT, 3,000. And Northern Territory, 3,000. The NDIA is committed to building positive outcomes for participants and their families and carers. The agency uses the NDIS Outcomes Framework questionnaires as one of the key tools to assess the medium and long-term benefits of the scheme. To assess the longitudinal impact of the NDIS, participants who entered the scheme in 2016-17 were asked, has the NDIS helped after one and two years in the scheme, allowing the NDIA to gain a better understanding of the longer-term impact of the scheme? During the June quarter, participants who entered the scheme in 2016-17, who have now been in the scheme for two years, were also asked this question. Survey results from this new group of participants have built on the results of the previous quarters, supporting the trend that outcomes— Thank you, Senator Rennick. Okay. Your time has Thank expired. You. Senator Billick. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And what a disappointing answer the minister representing the minister for the NDIS gave today in question time. She was asked three questions first up by Senator Brown. She took two questions on notice and she made a one we don't comment. And then when asked by uh, Senator Gallagher about the total underspend on the NDIS in the fiscal years 2017-18, and 2019-20, interestingly enough, the minister did not deny that there was an underspend. But what she did was say, well, I'll bring the budget books in. You know, it's a sort of condescending answer that, to be honest, I didn't expect from Senator Rushton. Um, but she did not dis deny at all that there was an underspend, and that tells us a lot. As a third-term government, the responsibility for the management of the NDIS has been on that side of the chamber for a very long time, a very long time now. And I think it was Senator Brown said there's already been six different ministers in the last six years. Um, so it can't get anyone to really commit to it on your side, I presume. Um, and we've got Stuart Roberts there as the minister now who's just failing so abysmally in the management of this important scheme. This scheme is there to meet the needs of some of the most vulnerable people in our society. 
in Australian society. And what do you guys do? You stand up and read out some facts. You make it sound good, but the reality is that you are not making the scheme work. The scheme is not working. It is not working, Senator Rennick. You've ripped billions of dollars out of the NDIS. You failed, failed to address the exodus from the National Disability Insurance Agency uh, of the executive. And you've been without a CEO now there uh, since April, over 100 days. You haven't even bothered replacing the CEO there. Uh, that, that's just a disgrace. But what you are doing, and what your side seem particularly intent on doing, is propping up the budget. And how are you doing that? You're doing that by underspending on the NDIS, while people living with a disability are missing out. They're missing out on care and support that is it's so important to their everyday living. Your, your government could take much more action on making sure that people get to live with dignity. With dignity. And what do you do? You go along and you cap the staffing levels. What's that do? Let's think about it. You cap the staffing levels. People get their, go to their specialists, go to their doctors, get, get their, tell what their needs are, get support for it. Go along. No staff there to deal with the issues. People are on waiting lists that are months long to even get their plans looked at. It's a disgrace. I'll tell you what, for somebody with somebody, for somebody with a person in their family who lives with a disability every day, this is exceptionally, exceptionally close to my heart. You would not believe how close to my heart this is. And when I see stories and when I hear stories and when I have constituents come to me and tell me that they've been denied something by the NDIS that will make their life just that little bit easier and they're denied it, even though their GP, their medical specialists and their carers have asked for it, I think you guys should hang your head in shame. It is an absolute disgrace. And I've seen that. I have seen that so many times you would not believe it. Senator uh, Scar said, oh, people should go and talk to their members and senators. Well, you know what? The system should work better than that. People should not have to. They do, Senator Wong, absolutely. They come to us all the time. But they should not have to. The system should be working so that people can get their needs met, so that they can live with dignity. It's pretty easy for you guys sitting there you know, in your little ivory towers. Do you have anyone living in your family with a disability? Do you have anyone in your family who is a paraplegic or a quadriplegic? Because I tell you what, if you did, I think you would be looking at this whole thing a little bit differently and you wouldn't be standing up reading out pages of gumph when, this, when the minister representing the minister in this place cannot tell us and will not even say that there, was no, there is no underspend. She did not say that. Let's uh, be Senator very Billick, clear. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Di Natale. Deputy President, um, we are right now in a climate emergency. So, we, Senator Di Natale, I, I, who are you taking I, I, note I rise of? to take note of an answer given uh, by Minister Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, Deputy President, we are in a climate emergency. We've just seen unprecedented fires in northern New South Wales and Queensland. The Murray Darling's running dry. Half the Great Barrier Reef is going or gone. We have farmers who have been pushed to the wall because our climate is changing as a result of the burning of coal, oil and gas right now. We have emergency services workers who are telling us that fires are now no longer able to be fought, and we are putting the lives of firefighters at risk. We have a community who understand just how critical it is that we come together and take action and ensure that we keep fossil fuels in the ground, that we not open up more coal mines, not that we not open up more gas wells for gas exports. And yet what's the response from this government? We have a government that denies the science. We have a water minister 
who doesn't believe that climate change is caused by people. We have a government that is too busy listening to their donors to act with the urgency that's required. And many people, many people are despairing for their future. Well, what gives me hope, Madam Deputy President, is that young people right around the country understand how urgent the situation is and they're taking action. Young people right around the world coming together, organising, many of them people who are absolutely clear about what is required. I've met many of them myself. Wonderful people, students, people who understand the urgency that is required. I was so proud to be marching with those climate strikers only a few weeks ago, people who inspired us to take the action that is necessary. I was out there with my kids because it's the future of my children, their generation, that's at stake. These are the young people of these young people of today are the leaders of tomorrow, and I hope that amongst them will be the next leader of the Greens and hopefully the next Prime Minister of this country, because they are showing the courage that is so sadly lacking in this place. And what again is the response from the government? to the climate strike, do it in your own time, coming down on them, saying to young students that we need more education and less activism. No, right now activism is what's required. We need people taking it to the streets, mobilising and organising like never before. Because in this place what we have is the power of vested interests, the coal, oil and gas industry donating millions of dollars into the pockets of both major parties, and what we see are those interest groups represented in here, not the views of the community, not people who understand the emergency that's confronting us, but what we get is the bidding of the fossil fuel industry expressed in our democratic parliaments. Well, they will not win, because what we are seeing is a movement of people like never before calling on parliaments right around the world to do what's required. They understand that we are in a climate emergency. They understand that this is an existential threat. And they understand that it's the power of ordinary people coming together, expressing their will through civil disobedience, through peaceful protest, marching in the streets, ensuring that their voices are heard. We stand with them. We'll be joining the climate strikers this Friday. We'll be joining the millions of people coming together right across the world and making sure that we bring their voices into this chamber, that we ensure that we communicate their message loud and clear, that we need 100 per cent renewable energy, that we have to keep fossil fuels in the ground, that we can't open up new coal, oil and gas wells, that the donations from the fossil fuel lobby have to stop. It is the Greens in this parliament who join with those climate strikers right around the world to ensure that the legacy we leave for future generations is one that allows them at least a chance of turning things around, because our planet Order. depends upon Senator it. Senator Di Natale, the question is the motion moved by Senator Di Natale be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.